everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Lermer, and I'm here today with Mike Manfredi, Brandon Lovejoy, and the mock Satoshi, Chris Barnes. I'd like to thank you guys for joining me today. Uh, I'd like to use this as an opportunity to ask some questions about Eden that the uh, community might have. Uh, the questions in this video are going to be free flowing. We don't necessarily know the answers in advance. Uh, our goal is to uh, share and discover and um, and then record this so that uh, everyone else who wants to view the video can enjoy it. So we're being uh, as transparent as possible with the Eden development process and working to disseminate information as quickly and efficiently as possible. So with that introduction, I believe uh, Chris has a question he would like to start with. Yeah, thanks, Dan, for this opportunity. This is great. Um, so the question uh, stems from uh, an AMA last week where uh, you clarified that once the official elections start, you will sort of assume the Satoshi for the first year, regardless of sort of there will be no sortition and no final vote for that role. Um, so the question I have is regarding... Can I, can I stop you right there? Because of course. Because I'd like to, co to correct the uh, assumption before you ask your question. Okay. Uh, as, as Satoshi, the interim Satoshi, I'm only retaining control over the bylaws. The Satoshi that is elected will still have all control over funding. So uh, I, I will be able to update and pass bylaws that impact how the community evolves and everything for the first year. Uh, after the first year, then Satoshi, one Satoshi can propose bylaws and the subsequent Satoshi can approve uh, amendments to the bylaws. Um, so my role is only informing the initial governance structure and rules and operations of the organization, but the funding and what projects get funded are entirely uh, the responsibility of the elected Satoshi uh, and uh, various levels below that. So follow. So will you participate then in these elections, or or, or not? Yes, I, I will participate in the elections for, for uh, becoming Satoshi. In which case, I would be both interim Satoshi and with a budget if I uh, am selected by the random succession to actually be the Satoshi. That's very clear. Okay. All right. That that makes much more sense. Yep. You're on mute, Mike. I am definitely talking to myself. Uh, one more question about that. You uh, you said bylaws, so not peace treaty. If there's a change that should be in the peace treaty, uh, that will not be the case. Um, yes, in, in theory, the uh, peace treaty needs to be ratified by uh, you know almost everyone in the community, or two thirds. Uh, I guess we're still working on on the process there, but in principle, the peace treaty is what we all unanimously agree on, and anyone who disagrees with the peace treaty is expected to secede. Um, I would, you know, request that if you want to be part of the community that I want to be a part with, that we we agree on the the peace treaty. But the goal is to keep the peace treaty as small as possible, and and therefore, um, moving toward immutability, having only the bare minimum. Um, process necessary in order to uh, secure the uh, election of people to update the bylaws and almost everything else should be in the bylaws. Uh, the bylaws being all the other rules and quote regulations that the voluntary members of Eden are expected to, to comply with as part of the you know, community effort to reach a consensus and do something together. Um, the peace treaty is more the the meta, you know, the agreement to the process. The bylaws is the agreement to the outcome um, of, of the process, uh, and the things that go in the peace treaty are the things that would, if violated, uh, hinder the ability of the community to reach a new consensus. Uh, the things that go in the bylaws are um, are all subject to change. Uh, for example, the smart contract code and the recording contracts that go with it those things would be part of the bylaws and not part of the peace treaty. The okay. fact that we're using fractal governance, the fact that there's going to be sortition at the top level, uh, the, uh, and a couple other facts would probably be more uh, peace treaty. And I know what Mike's going to, some of these things are not currently in the peace treaty. Hey, there uh, you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, 
So we, we are rolling things out very quickly. And effectively what the peace treaty says right now is that we use the process and the Satoshi is elected like, like Chris was elected with the, the highest level electing the Satoshi. Um, and that's sort of what everyone's agreed to in the, in the Genesis group. And as the community grows, we'll need to uh, get a new peace treaty approved. Um, my, my request is that as people are joining right now that you kind of, uh, until we get to the first year mark, uh, maintain flexibility that the, the de facto peace treaty is that Dan's forming this community and I wanna be a part of it. If I don't like what Dan's doing, I leave. And by remaining, I'm, I'm agreeing to what Dan's doing. Um, but I don't want to be in control this past the first year. I want to help birth it and then allow the community to go, go forth. And so the purpose of doing these calls is to make sure that we get as much educational material out there about the principles and the thinking that went into things like, why do we need sortition? Uh, and we can say, well, why wasn't sortition mentioned in the um, original peace treaty? That's because we were moving quickly. Uh, the book talks about the importance of sortition and how it prevents things. And there's lots of principles that go into it. Um, another thing that we will discover is um, the right solution is going to be, I guess, increasingly complex as we start to accommodate for the various edge cases and corner cases and, and refine things to prevent abuse. But complexity is kind of the killer of actually making decisions and moving forward. So we've been moving quickly with something that's simple and that works at a small scale. And as we grow uh, and as more money is involved, more of um, more complexity will be ne necessary to realize the vision of a uh, consensus building algorithm that represents the collective will of the people and, and maximally empowers the individuals relative to the group while respecting the fractal, uh, fractal realities of nature and how nature wants to organize things uh, for sustainability. So that's a bunch of buzzwords, but that's that's my um, my answer. Uh, on the on your so I, I I'm glad you clarified um, the 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 role you will assume as Satoshi, where you can change bylaws um, for the first year. Do you have are you any thoughts on how you might go about those changes during that year? You, you, would you expect um, are you going to follow the subsequent election to need to enact them or some sort of notice period or open discussion about potential changes just to keep that sort of no surprises type of thing? Yeah. I'm doing AMAs regularly, doing calls like this to have open discussions, to be transparent about the reasons for why things are. I'm even being transparent about the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm requesting that uh, people defer to me for the first year so that we can have a cohesive vision uh, rather than designed by committee. I think uh, handing things over to designed by committee too soon has led to a community without identity too quickly. Um, so, that's that's my request, uh, and um, you know, I guess in theory, I'm just putting ideas out there, and there can be any number of Eden communities out there, so we can have a multitude of experiments out there. But the one I want to participate in in the peace treaty I'm agreeing to is the one I'm specifying here. So everyone who wants to join me in doing something cool can can do this, um, recognizing that my intention is to create a system that not even I am guaranteed the power to lead or control long-term, uh, which is, I guess, my definition of a successful system is one that does not depend upon um, any personality. Okay, so we can expect these types of, it doesn't have to be as frequent certainly, but this type of transparency and sort of windows into your mind as to what you're thinking and why you're thinking it. And then that'll be a bit of a, a forewarning for changes that might come. So yeah, and yeah. when we finally do get the changes, they'll be published as recording contracts or code updates um, and, and so forth. Um, and we'll make sure that everyone knows this has been updated. This is why it has been updated. Anyone who objects, uh, you're free to leave um, and, and there's no hard feeling. Obviously, if there's very clearly a majority of people objecting or something like that, then uh, you know, 
uh, it's almost more of a direct democracy kind of thing. Um, but I think that the majority of people would like to see a consistent uh, vision with, with me leading uh, at this stage. Um, so I think that's sort of where the, the consensus is. Uh, trusting and to build a consensus process that the course to use without Dan. <laughs> um, and right now we're just using the early beta versions. We're all beta testers. More questions? <clears throat> well, you mentioned earlier, um, we shouldn't assume that people know what was covered in the AMA earlier today, but we can certainly link to that audio from that um, in the description of the video. Um, <clears throat> but you gave a lot of thought um, in response to why you feel like there needs to be an adequate um, fee or contribution to Eden membership. And it's a discussion that I think will continue to happen until uh, enough people are satisfied. And so this would probably be another good opportunity to talk about what, what are the, what do you think are the main, you know, without needing to explain to at length, what are the main factors that you feel um, drive the decision to set um, the fee at a certain rate versus like when, when, when how do we find the sweet spot? Let me rephrase the question. Uh, the pr purpose of Eden is for a community of people to come together, reach consensus and do something as a group in, in a more powerful nonlinear return kind of way. One plus one equals three. The, the whole is greater than some of the parts, right? So the idea is we come together, we do something as a group that then benefits every, every single member um, the, to really make this concrete for people. If you wanna build a piece of software, you don't have 10,000 people contribute one line of code. You have 10,000 people pool money to hire someone to write the code and then everyone uses the result in the software. The, there has to be a process to reach consensus on what the code needs to be and who they're gonna, uh, who's going to write it. Uh, but then everyone auto automatically agrees that, hey, once it's written, we're going to use it. Um, that's the type of power that comes from having a community of people working together and being able to reach consensus uh, and act with unity. So Eden is a governance process designed for groups of people and it should function entirely, even without outside subsidies like EOS inflation, given a community a budget. That is the, the premise. And if you have a group of people that don't wanna contribute any time and don't wanna contribute any money, well, that's like having 10,000 people that wanna write software and no one wants to pay for it. Uh, and if you have, well, some people wanna pay for it, but everyone else wants to have an opinion on it. Those are free riders. Those are, um, you know, like, uh, uh, welfare recipients that aren't paying any taxes, but they still get to vote on how to spend other people's money, right? And, and that's not in alignment with the philosophy of both independence, uh, which is one of the goals and of equal membership, right? True democracy only works at small scale with relatively equal peers. And if you have some people that are contributing a lot of time and energy and a lot of people and money and other people that are just having controlling influence but not contributing anything, that is a that is um, a problem. So we're in a situation where the EOS community, uh, the EOS token holders and block producers can choose to fund a group of people with millions of dollars. So the question is what group of people gets authority over how this millions of dollars should be spent? Um, and my argument is basically one from um, of skin in the game. People need to put in a little bit of their own money uh, so that they're committed to the process, they're committed to the group, and then the EOS token holders add or they match. You know, they might match one x, two x, ten x, but it's a matching instead of a um, uh, a granting, and that solves all kinds of conflicts, uh, prevents or minimizes civil attacks 
Eden is already designed to, to mitigate civil attacks, but it, it really um, uh, balances out some of the game theory associated with, with Eden, particularly when we're talking about, there's not just one Eden community, but potentially an infinite number of Eden communities. Uh, and how do you distinguish between which communities of higher quality? I would say that the highest quality Eden community is the one that has the most members who are collectively are contributing the most to the community and therefore can act with the most collective power and move further and further on the uh, scale of coordinated action. Um, that's gonna be the most effective, healthy Eden community. The weakest Eden community is the one that 10,000 people who can't even show up for uh, one day a year, right? <laughs> that's, that's the weakest people that don't put any money in. They're not really bought into the idea of collective action, of the idea that they need to partner with others. And so by asking for people to commit both time and money, uh, it's kind of an indication that they are committed to the idea of collective action. Uh, and and uh, uh, collectively, everyone who's part of the community is up to something that will ultimately benefit them uh, when it's created. Uh, and that the resulting you know, one plus one equals three is that we, we create the three and then we all benefit um, more than we would have if we just like funded our own little thing with our money. So it should be a net positive to all the members. Uh, and so if you, have, if you have a subsidy like EOS, uh, block producers potentially funding something with $10 million and you have a community of a hundred people, well, how much money do you think each person would be willing to spend to have authority over a much, much bigger budget? People would be willing to spend a lot to get that authority. It's a high value proposition to be part of eating community and, and you should have skin in the game. Um, Can I push back you say, a little bit? Go ahead. Um, so, sure. so uh, one thing that comes up for me is that it feels like you know, we're, we're dealing with a spectrum, first of all, so it's not 10 or zero, it's 10 or 20 or 100 or five or somewhere, you know, it's, it's a spectrum. We're not dealing with like no skin in the game or all skin in the game. And skin in the game is relative um, for different people. And so we have to make, we have to like, I think, identify by what metric or how, how we will know where we found the sweet spot where there is enough uh, skin in the game, but it's not restricting um, talent or insight or people that would otherwise not become engaged because they're um, just simply un un unwilling to, to put up those resources and that time. So let's, let's recognize that time is perhaps even the more valuable of the two. Um, so <clears throat> I guess, one thing I see is that... Can, can, can I say something with respect yeah. to this? There's a, there's a question that was asked on the AMA about which sci-fi um, story most captures what Eden's trying to do. And I was thinking about that more afterward. And I got to thinking about the Federation. And the Federation had something called a prime directive. Star Trek. That is, for those that don't that is in order to be a member of the Federation, you had to achieve warp capability. And furthermore, no member of the Federation was allowed to interfere with developing planets, right? So that prime directive kind of makes sense for, I guess, the Eden philosophy of uh, you don't allow someone to join the United States or join whatever democracy you're in until they've reached a certain capability that everyone in the group has. That capability can be measured in, in skills and in philosophy and time. They have to reach a certain level of maturity. They basically achieve warp capability. And furthermore, you don't interfere in the lives of people who haven't achieved that capability yet. Um, you, you kind of allow them to, you, you respect their independence, which means, you know, in theory, planets that haven't evolved warp capability, they can form their own communities uh, and do their things um, and, and so on and so forth. So that's sort of, um, you know, Democracy only works among equals. And if you say, well, we have some people that are so poor that they can't put in $100 a month, which it's poor according to US standards, uh, and other people uh, that can easily do that, 
you know, they can put in a million dollars a month, right? There's like two extremes there. They should not be in the same community. It's like having a, a warp capable species working with a non-warp capable species. Um, I think you're, I, I, I appreciate the analogy, but I'm not sure that it's completely appropriate for this. Um, uh, articulating why it might be a little challenging, but that's why we're I here. Would, I, I would argue that we want some degree of, um, you know, we don't want a group of people that all think the same. We, we don't want, uh, you know, we, we want to agree on common principles, but we don't necessarily want um, uniformity of approaches to solving problems. We want like a diverse set of tools in our toolkit with which to approach the problems that we face. We want a diverse set of skills to a point. among. To a point, yeah. <clears throat> right? We, our culture has said diversity is strength, but diversity is, is a bunch of people pulling in different directions. There's no uniformity, there's no consensus. So you need to have maximum strength, you want maximum consensus. Uh, and so if you can get a large number of people that generally think alike, to cooperate, that's good. Now, obviously there's always value in having outside the box thinking and having those seeds in there, uh, but that's sort of persuading the majority to adopt it. But when it comes to like people acting as a group, you want that group to be as cohesive as possible, um, not as divided as possible, which, um, you know, if you, have, if, you, if you only agree on like one thing, but you say, well, we're all gonna work together, then there's gonna be some, co some consensus is gonna bubble out of it. And the majority of people are not going to be happy with the uh, result and outcome if, if the people involved are too diverse. And what should happen in that situation is you should succeed and you should have two groups that are more similar rather than one group with a bunch of dissimilarities involved. And so there's a, there's a process here. And, and the, and that's why, you know, we're talking about people joining Eden right now. Uh, you know, as long as you agree to the process, that's the only thing we require of you right now. Um, and that, uh, that's not a long-term sustainable model because, uh, you know, we have to, the number of people who understand what we're trying to do with Eden and want to try this experiment is small. And so this kind of unites us. We're already largely united if you believe in the process, we, we have a lot of common, commonality already. Um, but as the systems mature, you're going to have uh, you know, more and more people who understand and believe in the process, but now they're gonna have differences in some of the area. And that's fine, that's good. They should, that's when you succeed and you have two eating groups. And that's why no one eating group should be larger than about 10,000 people because Dunbar's number and the need for diversity of ideas and experiments across communities. But within, within one community, too much diversity of opinion leads to eventual fracturing and chaos. So I agree, but I don't feel like we have that problem. And so designing for a problem we don't have um, in anticipation that it might exist by restricting access versus the tools that you just highlighted, which are effective at mitigating that like over diversity if it becomes an issue such as secession or, you know, and <clears throat> the fact that we have a peace treaty and the fact that we are all in the EOS community in this particular instance seems to be like a pretty healthy bulwark against sort of like fears of over diversity or over uh, too much inclusion. And like, if anything, I feel like, you know, we could, we could err on the side of too much inclusion and then pull back a little bit if it gets like out of hand. Um, for, that's my- you, you say that, but it's so much harder and emotionally difficult to say, sorry, we'd like you to leave because you kind of don't fit in anymore than it is to say, sorry, you're not invited in the first place. Uh, but, it's, it, but, it's, it's, it's much easier to invite people rapidly than to get rid of people rapidly. Um, and, and it's much harder to reach consensus than getting rid of people. So there's an element of be smart how you grow, be smart who you're inviting, because it's, right. it's going to be um, uh, a challenge in the future to have mass correction. 
of, um, it, of membership. Dan, it seems this ties into another topic from the book. You talked about manpower in the book uh, as originating from individuals. And I think that's something we've been taught over over time is not how that works. We think it comes from other people. We think it comes from those with authority and those with money. Um, I wonder how you're- Can I, wonder can I take a moment to like summarize that concept of manpower versus yeah, uh, wealth, um, just so that people who haven't read the book understand. Um, imagine for a moment that you're the last man or woman on earth. Uh, you have all the wealth in the world. You own everything because there's no one else contesting you. But you only have one manpower, which means you don't have the ability to maintain what's out there. Uh, your world and wealth, all the wealth decays because you only have one manpower. You maintain the status quo, let alone advance uh, the wealth and, and production in the world. Um, so, the collective power of mankind is always in the present moment. Wealth is, the, is just an incentive to get people to do things, but it's always people's beliefs and their coordinated action and their ability to reach consensus. And it's what they give their time to in the present that determines uh, what happens. Um, it doesn't matter how wealthy someone is, how much land someone controls, uh, they cannot take care of it on their own. So it's, um, so I think where this gets to is if you have a community of people that's not willing to commit their manpower to a cause, they can't produce any wealth. They can't create anything together. Uh, and so time, let's put, let's put money aside for a second. And just go to time. Uh, is it reasonable to expect everyone to contribute one day a month to the community. In, in that sense, we're all equal. In theory, uh, the person who earns minimum wage has less opportunity cost in terms of dollars than the person who earning a thousand dollars an hour, but you know, they're all putting in the same amount of time, uh, same amount of manpower. Not, not all people are equal. You know, an unskilled laborer's time contribution is very different than a skilled laborer's time contribution in terms of what it contributes to, to the cause. Uh, and so now you've got unequal contribution once again, uh, and yet in theory equal say. Uh, and so there's an element here of making sure that people in, in groups are equally, equally yoked. You've got people that are putting in time and money. Uh, and I think that kind of normalizes it because the rich people are very, very busy. It's a lot harder for someone like uh, Elon Musk to dedicate one day a month to something like Eden than it is for somebody who's unemployed to dedicate one day a month to Eden, right? There's uh, a lot bigger sacrifice being made um, to participate. Uh, so I think that's sort of the great equalizer between wealth um, and, and power is, is time because we're all only given so much time. Um, but if you only base it on time, then it's gonna be controlled by, by the unemployed. They've got more time than everyone else. And if it's only based on wealth, then it's gonna be controlled by the wealthiest. But if you combine both of them, now you've got a healthy mix where if you're unemployed, sorry, you're not, you haven't demonstrated the capability to be productive contribution. You haven't demonstrated that you're making a significant enough opportunity cost uh, to contribute. Uh, and if you're, not able to contribute the time, you haven't demonstrated that, hey, you're actually in this with the thing that we're all equal on. So I think that there's an element of it being healthy for a solid community to require both time and money. Uh, and by requiring both instead of one or the other, right? It's not like, oh, I get to put in my money, but I don't have to put in the time, or I get to put in the time, but I don't have to put in the money. But you have to do both. And if you can't do both, uh, then the system gets unbalanced. I, you know, this, this concept of both right now is being more fleshed out in this call. It's not like a pre-planned all this. So this is so, uh, on, innovation on this, in real time. If you mentioned a few times the, uh, like the monthly, and so that's like a, a monthly amount of time or money. And I, I know that came up in the AMA last week where it was how many 
elections we might see and how frequently they might how they might come. So I think the most frequent would be once a month in the bylaw or sorry in this peace treaty. Uh, it says point three elections shall occur at least annually or may be triggered by petition of 10% of the membership or according to the bylaws. I'm wondering if you have some more thoughts on on how does that 10% petition work um, and how sure. frequent you think these might be just talks about that yeah. Yeah, another example where the peace treaty uh, was an earlier rendition. Uh, we have since been working with the development team on, on the practicalities around getting a 10% petition and the potential vulnerabilities it has of uh, an active minority working to force elections on the majority, which doesn't want elections all the time. Uh, and so the slight tweak to that is that you have multiple rounds in the in an election, right? And we're coming up with names for them, like Satoshi's the top and we can call in the layer beneath that, the board. But if you take the first layer of representatives, which uh, I wanna talk about group size here in, in a little bit, let's assume they're groups of five. Uh, you, you've got 20% um, of the population, which is selected to be a layer one representative. Um, and that, uh, that group is, can then be used to, um, if you can get two thirds majority of that group, they can trigger an election. They're already chosen to be represented. They're already expected to put in more time and you're not requiring everyone to do it. Furthermore, it's representative of the whole. So any minority 10% that wants to trigger elections all the time is not going to be able to get um, uh, a two thirds majority of the layer one representatives um to to trigger an election uh, and then the bylaws kick in right the bylaws would be a satoshi approving it the next one and then that would say well we're going to do it every six months instead of so uh every year um the doing it once a month thing is is really derived from there needs to be about a one month notice of an election so that people can clear their calendars so that they can actually attend so that people can fund it which means that the maximum is monthly um, and it's and no election can occur without the 30 day notice. So that's that's where we get to. Well, theoretically, we could get get there. But in practice, the frequency of elections will be determined by the um, by the bylaws, which by consensus of the community of how often do we want to have elections and how stable can they be. Um, I want to add something here because we're building even one step at a time. Uh, and so we can add complexity as we go. But in theory, uh, the Satoshi could be three Satoshis that are a multi-sig based on the past three elections and they can have overlapping terms. And so you're, you're only ever replacing a third of the government per election, uh, kind of like how Congress in the United States works. Uh, and that can provide a little bit of continuity uh, across time, um, which provides a little bit of stability. That's a more complicated process and how do you bootstrap that process? Um, and so I'm, I haven't like outlined or been designing or writing software to handle those cases yet, but that is where I would expect things to evolve to. And I do believe I discussed this in my book of having uh, overlapping um, uh, governance systems um, and, and using time as an element of security under the principle that a system, a governance system optimized for humans um, should evolve towards stability that's consistent with, with humans. Uh, and it should have less and less change over time um, instead of something that's wildly moving all over the place, right? Stability over time uh, is is one of the goals of a system, but not too stable. <laughs> not, not so stable it gets rigid and can be captured, but it should start to, the, the process itself should start, and the rules adopted by the system and, and the community should tend towards stability, uh, toward the stability of things that make that community function. Uh, and um, which leaves that most of the, like once eventually bylaws stabilize and then it just becomes a matter of administering funds uh, for whatever services the community has agreed to collectively provide. Um, but that's longer term vision.
And just to follow up on that, there was, I recall, remember hearing before there was another trigger for an election and it was a certain percentage of population growth of members. Is that still, I don't think, I didn't see that anymore. So has that idea been uh, removed for now? Um, yeah, it's, it's an idea that um, as the community is growing, um, you need to make sure that those new people are represented in the consensus. Um, now, it's really easy to get a 10% growth in the community when you only got 10 people, right? You add one person, you're there. By the time you get to 10,000 people, uh, it's a little bit more work to grow by, by 10%. Uh, this is something that the bylaws uh, could cover as an automatic triggering of a new election. Um, and so I'm, I'm gonna leave that up to the bylaws, um, which the community will eventually govern. Uh, in the interim for this year, uh, we're still building the technology. We're still learning how to do it. We might not be technologically capable and coordinated enough to do an election every 30 days or every time we grow by 10%. So for the first year, it's gonna be, uh, we call an election when the software is ready to have an election <laughs> uh, and, and the people are aligned um, and then we'll do it at least once a year. Is, is how it's going to be. So as interim Satoshi, I can call an election with 30 day notice. And then um, eventually the bylaws will start taking over when elections are called. I think that will give us the most flexibility um, in this birthing phase. And first, just for people who are listening that may not know this, but the, when you say first year, that is after the first year following the first official proper election, correct? Now that's a very good question. It was kind of ambiguous. So let's go ahead and and uh, state that the first year would be, yeah, we'll have the first election once we have the first Satoshi uh, that's in charge of budgets. Uh, we'll go for one year from that mark. Uh, so it'll be, a, I guess, a little bit more than a year from the conception of the idea of Eden. And on that point, a lot of people have been inquiring as to when the first election would be held? What are the benchmarks we're looking for? Um, some people floated out the July 4th date, but is there a threshold we need to reach before it makes sense? Uh, I set a target of um, 1,000 people as part of Eden. Um, that target may have to be adjusted based on growth rate. I think we need to grow and grow and grow until we either hit a thousand and we kick it off, uh, or we um, or the growth rate sta stagnates and no one else has anyone who wants to invite or anyone else wants to pay the membership dues. And uh, and then as interim Satoshi, I'll call an election early if necessary. But the goal is to do it when we get to a thousand. Uh, the software will have to be ready uh, for that time. So that's the other um, requirement to have the election. I think the software is on track to be able to handle a lot of these things. Um, but the probability of hitting a July 4th date seems kind of small based on uh, where we are right now, but I definitely see it happening. Uh, well, definitely. I, I see it likely happening this summer um, as, as entirely achievable. Yeah, and especially considering the next mock election is July 17th, you probably don't wanna have the real one a week, two weeks before. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Wait, we're going to do no one. one. <laughs> no one asked if you could have election. the mock election on my birthday. Gosh. <laughs> Some people. Uh, <laughs> uh, don't mock the mock election. Um, that's uh, be really good to get that mock election done. So everyone who wants to participate in a practice election can participate. Um, and we can, you know, kick the tires around before doing the real thing. So we'll try to do that mock election with as much of the real infrastructure as possible for that mock election. Uh, or maybe we just do it similar to the original. Point is that people should have practice with the process, with the video conferencing, um, and, and, and we just see how it runs one more time. And then we'll probably do the real election a month later uh, if, if everything aligns. You, you've mentioned a few times uh, software 
uh, as being an, an important piece of the actual election. Can you speak and update us on uh, what that is or what it might be? Yeah, so we're, we're building software that's going to um, create cryptographically provable randomness for the uh, grouping of participants into the groups um, and for collecting the votes of the members in the groups for representatives and then sorting that the whole way through. Um, and then once the results are done, then the same smart contract will take the funds that are flowing in and make it available to those who are elected. So even though the discussions are happening on video and, and recorded Zoom calls, the blockchain will be tallying all the results of the uh, outcome of the process and distributing all the funds uh, with cryptographically provable randomness and integrity. For just since you mentioned this distribution of funds, I know in this mock round, I did not want to receive the funds in my actual personal EOS account. I wanted to receive it into a, an MSIG authorized account. Um, not to get too nuanced in something you haven't finished building yet, but will that be an option in this uh, distribution method? We are working on the ability to allow um, you to specify an account that you would like to receive funds and so the funds can flow into a smart contract directly um, instead of into your control, which then allows multi-sig or whatever else you like. But, um, but you would always have the ability to uh, change which account it's flowing to. Right. Yeah. I, that's in some of the discussions, uh, EOS governance chat quite a bit there. And one of them was, you know, what happens when, if, if you win, where, what happens next? Right. And it's, well, there should be a rule and, you know, we should have it so that it, the money should do this and do that. And I was of the opinion that I think less rules are, are better in a way. And let's just have people being forced to answer difficult questions while they're being interviewed by people who are voting for them and then how they so how are you going to receive the funds are you going to receive it in an msig are you going to and who's on that msig force people to answer those questions or at least force them to be exposed to them and we'll see if they uh spin and don't answer but uh and then if they make a commitment you don't need a hard-coded rule because now we're relying on the transparency and reputation and trust yep yeah, I agree with you on keeping the rules as simple as possible, especially in the Eden contract, and then integrating with other contracts for uh, you know, more advanced ways of distributing funds. Um, and then uh, over time, we'll add more, uh, I guess, template fund distribution algorithms that people can choose from, but because most people are not programmers, but for now, we wanna keep it as simple as possible. And for the early ones, Multi-sig might not even be an option unless you can control your Eden account with multi-sig. Um, and, but yeah, we are evolving in the way so that uh, smart contracts uh, and alternative governance structures can be put in place for controlling how the funds flow. One of the things that we are looking at doing is making sure that while funds are allocated on a daily basis, you can only claim them uh, once a month or, um, uh, right before an election and right after an election, if your if election occurs in the middle of a month, the idea is to minimize the number of potential tax events and valuation is required for uh, people that may be getting money. Uh, so that's an implementation detail that shows how uh, we're designing even to be considerate um, of tax consequences of, of the structure. Not that I want to hog all the time here, but I got that you made me think of another question here. So it, 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 this other one came up where if there is an election, someone wins money and they don't spend all those funds, somehow they, they haven't received all those funds. Perhaps this solves that because it'll be hard coded that there will be a, a distribution and the funds will be received and therefore allocated. But if there was a, a comment, I think, where if spends weren't um, funds weren't spent and another election came, which you'd have a month notice for, but uh, you would lose access potentially to some of those funds that might still be in Eden Pool. No. You get your funds and you can spend them during the month you're in office or you can spend them over the next 10 years uh, with you being the, the trustee for those funds. So there's no requirement that says that you have to spend those funds and as soon as you're out of office, you lose them. It's more like you were 
elected Satoshi, you were given a million dollar budget to do something for the community. Spend it over whatever time period you like. Um, uh, you know, the community is going to hold you accountable for what you're doing. They're like, oh, you're just sitting on it. <laughs> okay, I guess you're you're treating it as personal property. Oh, you're spending it over a couple of years to build this thing that's going to take more time. Then people have complete respect for you, uh, and and so forth. So it's not a obligation to spend spend it or you lose it. I think that's one of the problems with current government budgets. Good to hear. Awesome. Mike, you've been pretty quiet, but you had a good smirk going on there for a while. You got any? That is the smirk of just not quoting movies and going back to Star Trek references. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just being a good participant in a panel. <laughs> um, um. <clears throat> I, I have a list of questions I could always dive in, but just trying to be a good panelist. <laughs> All right, well, I'll jump in until you're like sufficiently motivated to like break through um, the, the low bar I'm, I'm setting here. Um, so my, my next question is you talked about uh, wanting, well, there's a, there's a few questions percolating up in my mind. One is we've talked a lot about the ideal number for participants in each of these breakout groups everywhere from 12 to Four we did in the um, initial mock election. Where's the sweet spot there, do you think? And how much of that is informed by like technological considerations? Yeah, yeah, good question. I meant to come back to that. Um, from a decentralized infrastructure perspective, peer-to-peer uh, -peer connections can only support so many video streams before you saturate your link. And if you go beyond a certain number of people, you need centralized servers that can process the video streams uh, in order to conserve bandwidth to all the participants, uh, kind of how Zoom does. There's open source software out there called Jitsi that allows web browsers to use WebRTC uh, and similar technologies to do video streams with five or six people. Uh, so that's a, a decentralized uh, existing technology that we could leverage. Um, but we've also seen that time is a critical um, component in consensus building. The more people that you have in a room, the harder it is to reach consensus. Uh, and so if you had the choice of having smaller groups and more layers, you could probably process that faster than larger groups with fewer layers. Uh, so um, my thinking is for technological reasons and time consideration reasons and just uh, the nature of a discussion changes as soon as you go from uh, four or five people to six, seven, eight people. Uh, all of a sudden, personalities, different people get shy and so forth. So I think going to have the most open discussion and the most efficient discussion. Um, if you have four or five people, which gives everyone 15, uh, 10 to 15 minutes to uh, argue their case uh, and discuss with other people. Uh, and it seemed to work really well in the mock elections. And it happens to align with the nature of the software uh, uh, limitations of internet bandwidth and so forth. So I'm uh, targeting groups that are four to, to six people in size and the algorithm for given a certain number of members in a community will automatically figure out the number of levels required to maintain those things. Um, uh, and uh, at each level in the tree, uh, you have to have at least three going to the next level, right? So that you can have some sortition, um, which means that if, let's say, you, uh, you have to have a community of at least 15 uh, in order to have an election where you have three groups of five, you then go to three, and then you randomly select among them. Uh, which means depending on the population, you might be randomly selecting between uh, three and 14 people, right? That's how many people you could be randomly selecting based on the rounding errors of the rest of the um, rest of the pyramid of, uh, of things. So that's what I'm thinking as far as group size. Uh, and that's just based on how things have been functioning. Uh, smaller than four, doesn't really give you a Byzantine fault tolerant 
option. And, you know, uh, and it's too easy to, to fail there. And larger groups have both technological considerations um, as well as timing constraints. Quick nerdy question. Um, <clears throat> it's been suggested to me in the past that there's no such thing as like truly random. How is how is randomness actually introduced into the into the selection and the sortition from a programmatic standpoint? Well, there's two ways <clears throat> two ways to get cryptographically provable randomness. One is to have everyone submit a hash or a secret and then require everyone to reveal. As long as everyone reveals, you have a random number. Yeah, it only takes one person to to foil that process by not revealing. I guess there's other more advanced algorithms out there that might allow a certain number of non, non committal uh, parties. The other option is something like proof of work, where you know finding a Bitcoin hash with so many leading zeros only happens with billions of dollars spent on electricity approximately once every 10 minutes. There's just not that many hashes with that few zeros. And so you can pretty much guarantee that uh, a Bitcoin block hash that occurs after a certain point in time is going to be random because they're mining it for another purpose and so forth. And so you can, uh, as the difficulty goes up on the Bitcoin block hash, the, uh, the quality of the randomness uh, is, is sufficiently good that it's unlikely that it's being used to manipulate a particular election. There's a, that's the cryptographically provable way that we're using. We're going to use Bitcoin block headers um, as the random source. Cool. Mike, you primed and ready? I'll, uh, I'm always ready. Um, I'll, uh, I'll give you one question. I actually have to get going momentarily. Uh, so I'll, I'll have this be my last question. Um, back to the manpower idea. Um, part of where I wanted to go with that is with matching funds, you've got this, I'll play because I can leverage other people's money, which is a clear motivator. Um, I'm just curious from a cultural standpoint, from a, from a mindset standpoint, what would you want, how would you want the people in the community, the members of the community relating to their participation? Um, and maybe even how would you want the source of funding to relate to their participation so that their personal power as like this, is, we are why our community is awesome. Like to, to me, how would you maintain that? Or how would you want that to be, to look? Yeah. Well, the first thing I think we need more education on is that in a Eden quote democracy, your influence is not one over N, where N is the number of participants, right? If you have 10,000 participants, your influence isn't one in 10,000, right? It's, or I guess I'm gonna use 3,000 because if you have groups of five and you've got five levels of it, your influence is one over 25, not one over 3,000. Um, and that is a huge, huge difference in how you relate to your influence to a community. Um, and particularly when you factor it over time. Over time, you're gonna be in different groups. There's nothing that's preventing you from getting elected at one level occasionally from time to time, maybe two or three levels. Uh, and so uh, there's a lot more say and power over the group decision in an Eden community than a traditional democracy. Second way of relating to it is, uh, everyone's here because we want to do something together. And we all know that this thing that we're doing together is designed to benefit us as individuals, right? You're not going to voluntarily give your time and money to an effort that's not coming back and benefiting you in some way. So let's say you've got a business that's building on EOS or you own EOS and you want the token price to go up uh, or you need freedom to transact and you're in Venezuela or something. There's all these different reasons. People have different reasons for wanting to participate, but they all want EOS to be successful as a currency. Uh, EOS to be more usable. Uh, they want more individual independence. So they have these things in common. And to the extent that by putting their time and energy into it, the community does something collectively that then ends up giving them more of that than they had before. That is a solid way of relating to things. Um, 
you know, the, the challenge we all face is we're trying to form new communities when the existing community we're in, aka our current governments, are taking a third or more of everything we have and we have almost no spare capacity to give to anything else, right? That's kind of how the system is designed to keep us on the treadmill and keep us enslaved and prevent us from reaching alternative consensuses because we just don't have the time or money to fund a charity or an alternative government. But in order to break free, in order to gain our independence, you, we as a people need to voluntarily make the sacrifices necessary to support two governments at once, right? The government running under Eden uh, that you, you want for the future and the one that's currently stealing everything they can from you out the, out the back. You, you've got to run fast enough to do both at once. If you don't, and if you're not willing to do that, then you're basically waiting for the current government to stop taxing you so much so that you can have money to start a new government. Uh, you know, th that's the, the choice that people are making. It's like, well, I'll just stay here because it's too much work and energy to break free. All right, you know, may your, may your chains rest lightly upon you. That's a hell of a phrase to end on, Mike. Does that satisfy your... <laughs> I wasn't going for that. It's just a question. May your chains rest lightly upon you. <laughs> May your blockchain. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. Very good. I think it's it's one of those it's one of those things that's very hard to see. It's an idea that we. It's so hard to to see. Uh, you know, I, I've heard how many times have you heard? I I want to make a difference, but I don't know how. In, in any context, right? Um, translating that desire to impact yourself personally, your community, your family, or the world, translating that into something um, tangible is, is quite a mental feat, I think, for a lot of people. Uh, so coming into this community with um, practical, um, practical, like, I, I'm going to impact something that, that I can relate to, something that doesn't sound pie in the sky, um, but something that is going to benefit me, right? I want, I want this for my community. I want to cause this thing and I need this re resource to make that happen. Let me get really practical. I want to enjoy Eden so I can participate in a process that can demonstrate to other people that this process can work. I can learn how to operate this process and then I can bring it back to my local community where I can use it in my church. I can use it uh, in my local farmer's market. I can use it in some way that is closer to home and it can impact me. And if right now, if the only impact that you're getting is an education and an experience and to demonstrate the power for others, that's a, that's a little bit that's tangible because you're getting that experience. You get to say you're a part of it. You're learning how it works and then you're learning how to replicate it. And to the extent that the purpose of the Eden community is to demonstrate and replicate the, the governance structure, uh, then I think it can be very, very successful at doing that. Um, the, the other purpose for participating is just, hey, I want to advance my career and I want to network and get to know people in the space. That's a great reason to participate. And now you can participate and actually have an influence um, and, and get an audience with people you'd never get an audience with if you didn't participate. So there's a lot of reason to... Um, to participate at various scales uh, and to relate it back to personal benefit. Um, if, even if you can't deal with abstractly the value of doing anything together, uh, benefits the whole, benefits the individuals uh, as long as the group is aligned with the individual's uh, interest. Yeah, when you talked about political playoffs with, uh, with the deck of cards in the book, that I've thought a lot about communities, uh, HOAs, churches, social clubs. Um, and I, I think that, I, I think, at least for me, e even thinking about those topics a lot on, in EOS where there's a potential for matching funds, um, I think that's kind of grabbed the, the conversation. Whereas when I think about any of those other, other non-crypto examples, it's more about, well, what do we want? Let's start with, well, what do we want to do? We'll figure out money and resources and whatever later, but what do we want to do, right? What are mm -hmm. some things we're interested in? We could be saying that 
uh, Chris, it's actually something I want to talk to you about doing with the board, kind of demonstrating this, but starting to chew on like, okay, well, for the trial election, we, we allocated the 1,000 EOs. Now what? Is that the end of the game? Or do we say, maybe you publish an opinion that this is what the consensus says. And the fact that we came to that with integrity, the expression of that opinion is interesting and influential with no money involved or, or just dues involved. I see a lot of power there, um, but it's something that I, I'm only getting glimpses of, which is why, why I wanted to kind of pull what yeah. I could out of your head. Well, just having a voice of the people, right? Or voices of the people of different levels um, is hugely valuable. It can be a social network in its own right. Uh, you want to reach consensus over an, an issue of, you know, pandemic response or, you know, you know, is somebody guilty, right? Let's, let's go ahead and try OJ, right? Or, or let's see what people, people think. Uh, we, we can identify and render opinions that, you know, the election was stolen or not, right? And we can actually have trials like that. And our community can say, yeah, our community consensus is 9-11 was an inside job or, you know, whatever conspiracy theory that people might have. Now we can actually have a consensus and a process that which, a process which people believe in, which can render opinions that differ from those of the Supreme Court or whatever government uh, self-investigatory board is appointed to cover up whatever government crimes are going on, right? It's an independent um, body of people that can offer independent opinions. So there's all kinds of uses for the Eden governance approach and the Eden, soft, Eden OS software that we're producing. The thing that's uniting us with Eden on EOS is the adoption, is a community of people committed to the adoption of EOS as a currency and as a smart contract platform. Uh, at least that's what I've put out there as what Eden on EOS is in this particular community. Um, and, uh, and to just demonstrate the process, it's, it's our, our trial balloon for the, the process to see how it works in a highly empowered way with lots of money on the line that is sure to expose all the strengths and weaknesses of, of the process as people fight for that power and money. That was, that was great. I do have to get going. Uh, Dan, thanks for taking out time. Uh, good to see you guys. Right. Ryan and Chris, thanks for being with us. And yeah. see you, I'll catch you guys later. Glad to see you, Mike. Have a good one. I was just going to say one thing before we do all disband um, about Mike mentioned, and maybe you did as well, Dan, about churches and, and just where we apply the Eden process. And it occurred to me that, you know, we look at cryptocurrencies as being this, this thing that disrupted financial and monetary institutions. And now I'm thinking the Eden process is something that will disrupt philanthropy. Because I find there's some interesting ideas with philanthropy. I mean, there's one libertarian perspective, perhaps, that says, I don't like giving money to just a group of people because it is wasted. It doesn't help enrich the people. I mean, the, the, the situation, their, their proclivities got them to where they are, so there's no value and it's just waste money. Um, and the same thing with philanthropy to larger institutions like United Way or you know, Red Cross, that, that we know that there's a lot of bureaucracy and red tape that siphons off, you know, this cantillon effect of siphoning the money before it gets to the end user. But now with this Eden process, there's this ability for both libertarian-minded and just traditional philanthropists to give directly to the community via an Eden process. So instead of just giving to a charitable, charitable group, give to the community and, and Eden can almost maybe sort of, there can be this become a nonprofit of sorts that its, its mission can be to proliferate and, and share materials and help communities run these elections. And then those who want to give libertarians or traditional philanthropists give to the community you want to give to but do it through the Eden process and even small local charities can still participate they can still be members in that local community and they still may receive funding but I think the you know the, the big United Ways of the world I, I don't see the CEO doing well in, a, in an Eden election for a local small community in Detroit <laughs> uh, you're absolutely true because it prevents incumbent advantage which prevents corruption so the um, the leaders of whatever nonprofit charity that you're setting up are going to tend to represent the will of the people and no one's going to uh, be able to get favorable position about now I'm on the board and I've been on the board for 20 years and I get to approve where funds go and yada 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 
none of that is going to be a sustainable source of corruption, which will keep it truer to its mission. Um, and, it, and that's the whole goal is that even as a process designed to maximize the, um, the benefits to the members, uh, mutual aid societies uh, and so forth. And if the members want to collectively contribute to charities, right? It's, you know, it's one thing if you give a dollar to someone, you can only do so much good with a dollar, but you get a bunch of people to pull money and, and build a well somewhere. Now you can do a good for an entire village uh, that you know, given bottles of water you know, that you can afford couldn't do. Uh, so there's, there's, there's nonlinear returns in collective action and that definitely applies to charity as well. Um, and if we can overcome the problem of anytime you concentrate wealth or power, you end up with corruption and, and the people that are contributing no longer have any say over what's going on. Charity is a perfect use case. Uh, and it speaks to what Mike was asking for earlier, which is as an ordinary person, why would I want to pay these dues? And what am I getting out of it? Well, if it's a charity, you're not paying dues for some benefit to yourself. You're giving for the benefit of collective action that is in alignment with the group's consensus. And as long as the group is sufficiently aligned with your principles and philosophy and how to do good in the world, right, you wouldn't want to join a charity <laughs> that uh, is full of people that are unaligned with you. But by selecting into a, a group of other people that want to give for a particular kind of thing, whether it's supporting people in Africa or uh, you know, researching cancer cures, um, the Eden process is a good way to make sure that the donors' uh, money is going toward the causes that the consensus of all the donors is aligned with. Uh, in a way that's democratic and not controlled by money interests. So I'd like to thank you guys uh, for taking time to join us on this call. And I uh, hope you found it as valuable as I did. And I think the community will enjoy it too. So thank you all for, for joining. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, See you uh, next time. All right.